Hello and welcome to Beyond Organic Wine. I'm Adam Huss coming to you from Piscinus Ranch in California. Thank you so much for listening. I just wanted to mention again that I created a Google group that I am inviting you to join. If you're listening to this right now, please join. The Google group is called Beyond Organic Wine. It's all one word. You can just sign into Google groups and search for Beyond Organic Wine, all one word. And click on it and then send a request to join and I will approve it. Now, why would you join? For three reasons. One, because you have knowledge and resources to share about wine growing and or winemaking from a beyond organic, regenerative, ecological perspective. Number two reason is because you have questions about wine growing and or making from a beyond organic, regenerative, ecological perspective. And three, because community is an amazing foundation for resilience. What I'm hoping and my vision for this group is that it will grow over time and become an amazing resource of knowledge sharing and crowdsourcing quick information from lots of different contexts whenever you have a question or a problem or just you know some of these random technical things that can come up when you're in the field or in the cellar and need a bunch of minds to weigh in on it. That's the idea behind it. There's no commitment to this. You can post a question, uh, you can answer a question, you can ask a question, or you can just lurk and learn and <laughs> and uh, just see what people talk about on there. And hopefully it will develop into a really helpful library. I've already started posting a couple questions that I don't know if they're helpful, but they're relevant to where my mind is right now. <laughs> and uh, I invite you to come and post some of your own or answer some of the ones that are there. Okay. Um, again, Beyond Organic Wine, all one word, search on Google Groups, and just ask to join. It's that simple. My guest for this episode is Megan Bell of Margins Winery near Santa Cruz, California, and this conversation may cause you to have strong emotional reactions at times. That's not a trigger warning. I don't do those. It's a tease. Megan has hot takes on just about every topic related to wine, and I'm not shy about asking her some big questions. Most of all, I think you'll really come to love Megan's honesty and openness about her struggles and visions, some of the financial and business realities of her winery or operations, and the state of the wine industry from her perspective. Her candidness is refreshing, and her dreams are inspiring. One note, though, Megan has had a lot of press lately, and I wanted us to spend our time talking about big ideas and values rather than the details of events surrounding her winery operations. But you can easily learn more about all of that by searching online and finding the many other places where she's been interviewed, quoted, etc. I highly recommend doing so, and I think you'll definitely want to learn more if this is your first experience of Megan. Enjoy. Megan, welcome. Thanks for doing this. Hi. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Megan Bell, Margins Wine Winery. Um, is wine dead? <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what that means. <laughs> I'm going to go with no. <laughs> okay, good, good. Um, do you have hope for the wine industry? Or or maybe maybe they're two separate things, wine and the wine industry. Do you think they're two separate things? That's a good question. Yeah, I would say I definitely think they're two separate things. I don't think either of them is dead. I think that the wine industry is in a process of a very large change and general shift. And it's just unfortunate that those of us who are making wine right now have to be a part of it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Do you, I mean, what do you see happening with that shift? Um, or what do you see are the reasons for that? I think that a lot of the reasons for it have to do with like just the general zeitgeist right now. Like no one is, I don't think, feeling particularly hopeful. Um, hmm with the state I mean I guess it depends on your views on a variety of subjects but I would say most <laughs> of the people that buy the type of wine that I make are not feeling particularly hopeful right now as we go into a year where we could potentially have a conservative majority on the Supreme Court for a period of decades and that is seeming more and more likely Mm -hmm. um that's definitely on my mind and i feel like it's on the mind of a lot of other people especially women it 
um, that yeah. along with climate change and, um, you know, funding being cut for so many important things like education. And I don't know, I find myself just kind of thinking about these subjects every day and feeling like the future, the near future could look pretty unrecognizable from what we've lived in so far. Mm -hmm. Um, Especially if like we're on the brink of another world war, for example. (laughs) Um, Yeah. And yeah, I think that all of, I think that capitalistic anything, including selling wine is just cannot be separated from the rest of what's happening in the world at that particular time Mm. um so i just and like wine itself is so light-hearted and doesn't matter in so many ways and in like my more positive and hopeful moments i'm like no matter what happens people will be (laughs) coming back to remember what's important like friendship and um and good food and good community Uh, no matter what people live through, just like they have over and over again throughout history. And that seems like a very um, simple way to think of things. Like, I want to believe that, but I just, I don't really believe it. I think that, you know, there's just very few people alive right now in our country who have been through, like, a world war, for example. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and (laughs) I think we just don't really know how it feels to live through a time like that. And, but I'm guessing that this feeling that a lot of us are feeling right now is the beginning of how that might feel. And Mm. yeah. And sorry to jump into that right away, but that really (laughs) is, that is what I think a lot of the problems that, that we're facing right now are connected to. Yeah. I mean, it's the backdrop to right everything that we do and i mean it's i mean i'd say that for myself you know i you know i don't know if you would say that but like that's i think about that all the time yeah i mean it's I, yeah like what is the relevance to what i'm doing in in relation to that and then at the same time like i feel sort of like my only solution is to continue doing it because you know like i don't know it's where i can affect change You know what I mean? Like, if I can affect change at all, it's like, that's the only place. So I might as well just keep working in that direction. I don't know. How do you feel? How do you take where you are and take all all that backdrop and think about what, think about wine? I was thinking about that when I was in the vineyard yesterday of just like, what, what this looks like in a year. And depending on how, you know, things play out across the world and in our country. Um, and like feeling, I mean, this is so selfish, but like feeling grateful to be in California, which is a new feeling for me. I've, I felt very trapped in California the last, however, so many years because I live in a prohibitively expensive area. Mm -hmm. Um, but like for the first time in a while, I'm like, well, I mean, theoretically we'll still have states rights <laughs> in a few years and at least I'm like in this state where I won't have to register as a single woman like when I'm going to take a trip for example mm. um but like how I I think for me it's like how can I uh, of course people throughout history have just continued to work and do their jobs and play their role in society despite like horrible things that were going on around them and right. that that is essentially world history like you know like people yeah. people keep going and that's like a beautiful part of the human condition is resilience but it's definitely like a dragging feeling of like what is even the point of this if like my peers who live in x state who are like single women can't travel for example without permission like yeah. Do I even want to do I even want to do anything that involves leaving my house ever? Like do I just want to crawl on my bed and never leave? <laughs> um and like I know I'm not the only one that feels like that. I'm sure some people are like you're being dramatic. That's extreme, but uh you know, a lot of a lot of what I'm saying is oh, it's not it's potentially not that far away. And um and 
I think that people feel it and that is why things feel like a real slog right now to everybody, most people, most normal, you know, normal income people. Um, mm. And, uh. and uh, yeah, hope, mm. hope feels a little hard to come by right now, I guess. And, and, that, and that is affecting wine as well. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's hard to, yeah. I mean, what I was going to say is there's a lot of discussion about this, obviously, in wine trades and in just in the business in general. And I don't think anybody actually is saying what you're saying. I mean, to a certain extent, they are like, you know, behind closed doors, maybe, but everyone's looking at like generational differences in drinking and the aging out of baby boomers and pandemic stuff. But I kind of tend to agree with you that it's more about these other things <laughs> that you're talking about that you've already so eloquently um, mentioned. Do you, how, how do you feel about sort of some of these other explanations and things that people look at when they're looking at, you know, what's happening with wine? I mean, the things that people that are like mass market trends, you know, right. that are being pointed to, of course, are founded in data. So like there's, there's reality in all of them. Um, but like right. some of them don't make that much sense to me. For example, people, people that are in their mid twenties and younger don't drink wine anyway. Like that was, it wasn't, right. it's not just Gen Z, it's all generations, um, like <laughs> right. millennials too. You know, people were panicking five or 10 years ago when millennials were that age. Of course, I'm one of them. Um, that like our generation doesn't drink and it's wine. It's like, no, no, our generation doesn't have spare money right. yet. Like yeah. we're just in a time where you have spare, the vast majority of people have spare cash when they're so much older and that's the time when you might start getting into wine that doesn't cost you know fifteen dollars or less from a from a grocery right. shelf or a liquor store shelf or what right yeah that was my experience too i didn't really you know kind of fall in love with wine to the point or even have the money to spend until yeah 30s probably or yeah. at least late 20s yeah yeah, and then you know the other part, which I am, is definitely true, is like so many places where one would purchase wine are closing. Like we're seeing mass closures of wine shops and restaurants throughout the country as expenses soar, and nobody it feels like can make this work. I know that there are exceptions to that. I'm sure some people are doing fine, but I think like every other day. There's like a San Francisco Chronicle article about one place or another that closed or like they're one break in away from shutting their doors forever. And I definitely like can empathize with that feeling that the the people share these like raw quotes when they've just come to work and see that they've been robbed again and all their glass is broken of just like, why am I doing this? Mm -hmm. You know, why keep doing this? And there are good things, of course, about what we do, which is why we keep doing it. So, like, there's reasons to put on that list. But it can be really hard to remember that when you've really just been asking the why question over and over for, you know, six months to 18 months or more or yeah. longer. Well, let's um, – can we dig into that? Because I know so much of what you've been interviewed about and, you know, what you've been asked to talk about are – which I, I think is really important. You're, you're great about being transparent about the realities of the business side of wine. So, but I, and I, and people can read about that and find out more by just, you know, looking at all the articles that you've been quoted in, but let's go to the opposite side of that, which is like, do you, what is the more, what is the beyond business side that kind of like, you know, why did you get into wine in the oh. first place? Um, well, I think my story is, <laughs> I've never met anyone with this particular story. And <laughs> at the beginning of like starting the company and, and also just being in the wine industry, I, I did not share this story because it seemed so like I was some sort of wine heretic. Um, but I share it now just because I, 
I think that there's probably a lot of other people starting out that feel this way and I want them to know that like it's okay um which is like I I was not passionate about wine in in any way when I started (laughs) this industry and I still don't feel like I am Mm -hmm. but you don't have to be like fiery passionate about wine to like have something in the wine industry that's really important to you that keeps you going and for me that has been being passionate about organic agriculture and being passionate about getting more marginalized communities into roles in wine uh, wine production where where they have you know good pay and they're in a managerial role or they're just like given opportunities that that they wouldn't normally get and I experienced a lot of that when I was first getting started um Mm -hmm. and that's where like that's why I'm so passionate about these things you know just people telling me in various ways over and over again that I didn't belong in this industry either because I couldn't afford the fanciest bottles or because I like actually just didn't care about those bottles and still don't care or because I was a woman and I would never be able to like women are bad at driving so like how could I possibly like drive a truck and pull a trailer and like how could I learn about machines and how could I be dressed in nice clothes for like a dinner and then the next day change into working clothes or overalls in order to do my job (laughs) Like, how is that possible? Um, So, yeah, for me, like those couple of things, like the agricultural part and just um, helping people get started in this industry in wine production have meant so much to me. And I have some very long term goals that involve those things that kind of are my why, as you said. Mm -hmm. My yeah, I mean, I share a similar at least state now i mean I, i've evolved in my you know perspective about wine over the time that i've been <laughs> involved with it but yeah I, you're you know a woman after my own heart in yeah. terms of what's important to you and what keeps you going in it um why what what do you want to talk about what those long term things are that keep you going and i, mean, I don't even I, know if uh, go ahead no go ahead go ahead these long term things could change yeah uh, the goals you know and like i don't even know if they're possible anyway in california and i've said to people over and over like you shouldn't do wine in california you should move somewhere else and like i've thought about what it would mean to take my own advice but with the state of how things seem to be going in the world i don't want to leave this state because it seems like (laughs) it might be the last refuge at some point (laughs) yeah Um, so you know a lot of factors yeah, uh, secession may be in our future uh, <laughs> yeah, we'll or we'll see. get we'll kicked see out what's, what's coming. <laughs> um, um but yeah for me they would be like you know having a cyclical program that hosts folks and where like either they're paid or they just get room and board and they like stay and not only like work in production and the vineyards that these are theoretical vineyards since obviously I don't own any land um, <laughs> or at least any least any like large parcel of land um, so not only the production and farming side but also like the business side like you see the numbers you work in this office you send the emails like why am I doing it like and and I think that over time like I have realized that a joke was sort of played on me throughout so much of my career and learning, not just me, but everyone of, of people in roles of higher roles of management seeming like their jobs were just so difficult and like (laughs) that they, like there was no possible way that, that someone else could, could learn to do that. And like another factor of that is people not wanting to be transparent. Like why wouldn't you let, you know someone trying to learn about wine production see your finances if they're trying to learn about wine production right there's something there you don't want them to see you know and i'm much more like you should really see this (laughs) so that you can make an informed decision about if this is the thing you want to dedicate years of your life to 
Um, but yeah, sort of like a, it wouldn't, it wouldn't actually be a business co-op in any way. Um, but I have a background in cooperative living and that is sort of the vision, um, Mm. that I have. And I think it would be very cool to, you know, bring people in for like a ninth, nine month cycle or whatever and have new folks every year. And, um, yeah, just like get people the skills they need to be able to manage things and, and get hired for those roles instead of this idea of like starting at the bottom and working your way up over a period of years just seems to me not to make any sense when when if you have people with like drive which is which is most people right Mm -hmm. like they can learn a bunch of skills concurrently and then all of a sudden they're equally capable of management Mm -hmm. Um, yeah yeah so this is a thing that probably won't happen but (laughs) it's a nice idea and so it sounds like you you want to be an hr is that what you're saying (laughs) well i feel like i already mostly work in hr nice yeah and like and and that is something that i think we should tell more people yeah who get who who want to start their own wineries not people who work in wine production because you know if you already work for a company there, you know, there's the roles are divided up and you're going to work in your role. But there's so many people now that are like, I want to start a small winery, but my job, the j- percentage of my job that is winemaking has to be less than 5%. It's yeah. just, that's not the job that I do. And yep. <laughs> what I've learned over time is that I really would have been better off pursuing a career in business operations or HR because- right. I'm good at it. I'm better at it, I think, than the winemaking part. Um, but uh, I would say most most people who I know who has, also have small wineries, that is not the case. And it probably would have been good if they had known what they were going to get into <laughs> before they did it. Right. <laughs> yeah. No, it's true. I mean, I remember you know, the harvest that I realized I was a truck driver more than I was a winemaker, you know, <laughs> and, yeah. and things like that, you know, I mean, it just depends on what you're doing. But yeah, like, I, I feel it's true for any small business, which is, yeah, like the it's human skills and business skills. And and I think that's the conundrum, because you, you get into this kind of thing. I mean, maybe not in your case, because of this, but often because you really enjoy the lifestyle, enjoy, you know, you're passionate about whatever it is, wine. And then you realize like, oh, I have to be passionate about business to be successful at this, which, Mm -hmm. you know, often I think I'm speaking for myself, more of a creative attachment to the work in wine that I do rather than like the sales doesn't turn me on, you know? Um, I don't know. Do you, do you get into sales? Is that fun for you? Or is it more the management, like of the whole operations thing? I, it's more the management. I yeah. there was a couple years there, going through like intense depression throughout my twenties, where I just told different markets that it was it was better if I was not there in person for any work with, <laughs> <laughs> like better for them, more likely to sell, and that me being there what might ruin it um that was that was a line i used for a long time uh and and i still believe that that was accurate and then you know got started working on my mental health and was able to like come out of that pit and feel like i was an asset to conversations again (laughs) um and (laughs) since that time which was probably not that much more than a year ago. Um, now I now I enjoy that side more, the salesy side. But um, people are cyclical, also, just like seasons. And I yeah. think that you know isn't addressed enough that like the skill set you're proficient in in one season of your life might not apply all the time. Right. So yeah. I'm glad that I came back into a season of like enjoying the sales part more and wanting to make those connections but for me so far i have consistently been very interested in logistics and forecasting um and i really enjoy 
that side of the business. Hmm. Now, it sounds like a little like you could be scaring people away as much as you want to, you know, help develop people. <laughs> Do you, <laughs> what's the balance there? Are you, uh, is it just being honest? You're just trying to be honest with people. If you want to get into this, I want to help you. But the way I'm going to help you is by explaining how difficult it can be. Yeah. I think okay. giving bite sized morsels is good. So, mm. like in this, like, very hypothetical program I envision. It's not like they would be thrown to the pit in day one of being like, here's a spreadsheet, make make us net positive for next year. <laughs> <laughs> like that would build those skills would build over time. You know, you start with basics and then um and then you add things over time as uh you know just like people raising kids say like age appropriate activities or whatever <laughs> like you're not gonna give the four-year-old a thousand piece puzzle but you can have them start on one with 25 pieces and by the time they're eight maybe they can do a bigger one um, and I know we don't you know this theoretical program doesn't have that much time but I think laying a realistic foundation for people not necessarily giving them like every single aspect of the information for example like my employee who's I only have one full-time employee she's been with me for a year every month I add some information to her orbit <laughs> that that I didn't necessarily want her to have before because it would make it hard to you know be positive and forward-looking in her job but as things progress and you you know have more data of like proving to yourself like I can do this and also wow the business seems to simultaneously function while it seems like it's going out of business <laughs> um, <laughs> which is something that I've learned you know over the last eight years so I have more confidence in that um, and yeah and I there there's you know there's strategy and care involved in, in how much information you share with someone but it doesn't mean you can't pave a realistic foundation. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I think in some ways, you know, we're so much of what we do, we're deluded into thinking we're doing one thing. And then really what we're doing is just like trying to grow and evolve as human beings, you know, whatever it is that we're involved in, we think we're, you know, trying to like prune a vineyard. <laughs> But mm -hmm. um, there's actually like more important work that we're doing that we're not even aware of. And if you get if you lose sight of that when you're in the in the shit, so to speak, like, you know, it makes it a little onerous. And if you can remind yourself like what you're actually doing, uh, it can, you know, elevate almost anything that you're doing. I love I that know, idea. You... And then like the other the same sentiment, but the other side of that is also like for me, trying to remember that nothing I do really matters in a good way, mm -hmm. in a good right, way. Right. Like, yeah. like we, we all matter. Like our actions ripple and influence other people. But like, should this business fail, I will still be alive. I will still get up in the morning. I will one day have another job, you know, like yeah. time will go on and that panicky race to the finish line the clock is counting down feeling that i think so many of us who own small wineries have feeling can be really difficult to step away from mm -hmm. um and like that makes sense because there can be real financial consequences for sure and i think that's what's scary but ultimately you know what i do day to day is standing in a vineyard looking at barrels of wine and talking to people about drinking so <laughs> the stakes aren't as high as it may seem <laughs> <laughs> what do you say to people when you talk to them about drinking um like, which you part? do you work well do you work in your tasting room the cubby i do sometimes it was not my vision to be working there at this point uh -huh. but um I have worked Thursday. We've been open for six months and I have worked Thursdays and my wonderful employee broke her knee. So oh. she's out for two months. So I'm picking up some of that. Gotcha. Um, 
So what Slack. do you? So yes, I I get to I do get to talk to people about drinking on at least once a week. Well, so when you given the things that you care about with your wine, like how do you introduce people to your wine? Um, I try to like the everyday people who come mm-hmm. in who don't have like a wine background necessarily. I try mm-hmm. to let them dictate the conversation. Like I don't mm-hmm. say the same thing to anybody. Right. So wherever they're at, I will meet them at that spot. I'm not trying to shove like a message really down their throats. There is some information yeah. I'm trying to share with them, which I tell almost anyone who um, makes it clear that they don't have this knowledge, just like the ingredients thing. Like okay. people don't know that and yeah. they should know you, that. Do you list ingredients? I forget. You do, do list ingredients. Now. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, people people just don't realize that there's more in the wine than what's on the label. I mean, of course, right. that has been intentionally lobbied for, but right. and yeah, it worked. Like people, right. they don't know. Um, right. And then I I will tell people about organic farming just because I I live in you know this town that is the center of organic produce, basically Santa Cruz and Monterey County living in Santa Cruz and wineries close to Monterey County in Southern Santa Cruz. And there is very high public knowledge here about what organic farming is. And the fact that people do not inherently apply that to grapes and wine is confounding. (laughs) Um, So because, because I already have most people who have a, a baseline of that knowledge, I will talk about that to almost everybody as well. Great. Yeah. How do you address that? Like, what do you say? Just that you use only organic grapes or what, what's your Um, I will just introduce? tell them basically that it doesn't make sense for them to only buy their produce from like orga- local organic CSAs and then be buying wine from anywhere that is a smoke and mirrors type of place. Right. Like, and, and they, they just have never heard that before in most cases. And it's not, they're not really resistant to it. It's just brand new information. Yeah. 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 I find that as well. Why did you start caring about the farming? I mean, why was that? Yeah. What what was that all about? What is that all about? (laughs) Um, I don't, I don't know if I can pinpoint a specific thing. I, me too. I, <laughs> yeah. It's um, like the more you learn, the more the more the your appreciation for the importance of it deepens. I mean, that's with me. Like it's like the more I learn about whether it's biology, ecology, you know, climatology, like you name it, it just seems yeah, I don't know. I'm sorry, I'm answering your question. What's what's your answer? <laughs> oh that I mean that's a great answer. And I think for me, it, it, it just, there was no other way since I've yeah. been an adult and we'll just define adult by 18 for these purposes. Like yeah, basically as soon, as soon as I was in college, I was like very quickly part of this community that I referenced earlier um, that, I mean, what we were doing for the age that everyone was, was actually really incredible. Like we, there's one of the first grocery um, grocery store f- food co-ops is in David. I went to Davis and mm-hmm. um, the people that founded that store also lived in the co-ops that I lived in in school. Um, mm-hmm. But we would, everything was like so coordinated. Like we, if you volunteered hours at that food grocery store, a certain number per week, you could get an enormous discount on groceries but like Mm -hmm. a normal family would not have the enough people to get these hours it was like i don't even know maybe 30 hours a week or something but because (laughs) we had 12 people in each house we could Uh. easily split that and we were you know it was called being a super worker (laughs) just so so we would do like super working and get our discount and like we bought all of our food in bulk when possible and like only organic products for sure. We had um, a whole network set up with, 
with different grocery stores to be able to accept their quote unquote spoiled, but really perfectly fine produce um, Mm -hmm. that we would like pick up in our bike carts because people didn't drive, but we had all these cool bikes with, you know, wheelbarrows on them basically. Um, So we could, (laughs) and then a lot of people that I lived with were part of a program called project compost on campus that basically coordinated the pickup of compost from the entire university and like whatever was good, we would just take home and eat. And then there's a student organic student farm at Davis. And we also had hours set up to volunteer a certain amount of time per week in order to bring that produce back home. Like, you know, so that was, that was my foundation of food systems at the age of like 18, 19. And I never looked past that. Like I didn't grow up that way. Like that's, that's not how my family ate. They're very interested in the eating this way now. Um, Mm. as are a lot of American people, like these ideas just weren't as prevalent in 2008, 2009 before. Mm. Um, but yeah, I I don't know. Food systems are an integral part of how I contextualize wine. Yeah. And yeah, it's just wine is food and and it can't it can't be separated. And <laughs> so so when I was jumping into the wine industry after graduating, the it was the same exact application of ideas where like I ended up some of my first internships were in places where I was like, what, like, why are we adding powder? What are these powders? I don't <laughs> understand why we're doing this. Like before we even know what this wine is going to be, why are we already like messing with the ingredients? Yeah. And like, after I worked this job in Napa right after I graduated, I remember my parents being like, so do you know how to make wine now? I was like, I've never been more confused. <laughs> like, I don't understand what I was doing because I thought wine was like, just like most people, I thought wine was like made of grapes. But <laughs> it turns out that if if we had made wine just out of grapes, it would have tasted a lot different than the wine that we were making. <laughs> Where do you fall on natural wine now? I mean, clearly, I I should preface that, I guess, by asking, didn't that lead you to sort of embrace natural wine or or the the, the ethos behind natural wine? Yes, but from from this, like, ingredients perspective, so much less from the dogma that (laughs) has infiltrated (laughs) the community, you know, of, of like, well, I just decided that I don't like wine with sulfites, but I do cocaine and I eat meat and I eat dried fruit and I eat french fries and all of these things basically every food has tons of sulfites in it most of them way more than wine um so like the idea that someone like is anti-sulfites is like I'm totally down with but I'm like cool show me your raw vegan diet and I will I'll be so into it and like I'm I'm on your side I support you for that raw vegan diet that is a lot of work um but just doing something because of dogma has mm. never been my foundation or even remotely interesting to me. In fact, when people talk, I often won't even entertain a conversation about sulfites because it's just so backwards and boring <laughs> to me. Yeah. Um, but anyway, uh, I, <laughs> yeah, yes, I definitely cared about ingredients. So for me, it wasn't like, oh, I want to make natural wine. It was simply like, I want to make wine without these powders. Right. <laughs> I just want to make wine that's made of grapes. Yep. And, oh, and like, I do, do I add sulfites? Yes. Yes, definitely. But, you know, 20 to 35 parts per million, which is a lot less than a French fry. Yeah. And I mean, even that, I, I, sort of made a policy that I'll never discuss like the amount that I add, which, you know, I could say is very low, you know, but I just, I had somebody ask and I was like, to me, I was like, this is something if you study wine chemistry, you know, if, and you want sulfites to be effective and not just be adding sulfites 
for no reason like there's a certain level for a to achieve a molecular level of sulfites in your wine it's based on ph and all these other things that like when you're trying to have a conversation with a distributor or a wine shop that's like oh yeah that seems like a lot of sulfites and you're just like you know nothing about like what the like why the wine needed that amount of sulfites like i why am i even telling you i should just be like oh it's very low i don't even know we don't test it's very low <laughs> or something you know make something up or just say i don't discuss it because it's like do you know how to make wine like do you make wine do you know why we add sulfites and why you know anyway sorry yeah so Tangent. on our <laughs> ingredients label I have listed hand harvested grapes and sulfites. You can't say organic grapes unless, uh, I mean, you know this, of course, but just for listeners, uh, it, they are hand harvested organic grapes, but you can't put that unless it's certified organic and you have like a separate you know, form that you filed and seeing that we're still a two person company, um, <laughs> I won't be filing those forms anytime soon. Well, no. Um, in your ingredients, you could list it if the vineyard had a certificate. Oh, at least yes, that's probably true. But I think you. Well, but you can't say it like on the label, like separate from an ingredients list. You can't be like yeah. made with organic grapes. You can't do that. And most of the vineyards, I think I only work with three vineyards that are certified organic out of the eight or nine that we work with year to year. Um, Although but I, I saw everybody's... something really clever where somebody put ingredients on the front label really big and therefore they were able to say organic grapes i was like oh that's actually really clever yeah i'm all anyway. i'm i'm all for that i'm all for whatever ingredients people want to list i don't even care yeah. what they are they should be on there <laughs> yeah i mean especially like <laughs> you are the the last person that needs to list ingredients there's like two sometimes not even two probably but in the past i think um you've experimented with some zero zeros right Oh, I only did it once. Oh, okay. Never mind. First yeah. year. Yeah. <laughs> Quick lesson. Um, yeah, no, I, I, uh, yeah, I think it's, yeah, everybody that's making conventional wine, so to speak, that's the, the really important ingredients list. You know, what's really fun is sometimes when a, a wine is certified organic, uh, they have to list ingredients. Like when you can, you know, when they say organic wine on the label, Mm -hmm. and that's really fun when you see like a big company who does it like ralph's did an organic brand and they had to list ingredients and it was it was like a 10 ingredients list you know <laughs> and i was like there you go i love that yeah yeah i i try that's something i talk a lot about with people in the tasting room also because people read our sign our little a-frame sign that says like organic grapes and they're like oh you make organic wine and then right. that invites a conversation about various other types of smoke and mirrors in the wine industry. Right. Um, and yeah, and people, like their eyes never glaze out. People are interested in, in ways that they've been lied to, you know, in to bring it full circle yeah. in all kinds of different political ways that we're, <laughs> you know, that people have been experiencing for a long time, but just seem particularly uh, invasive right now. And, yeah. and they're interested uh, in it, in their food as well. At least in this part of California, I realize it can be different depending on where you live, but um, there is a real hunger for, for that knowledge, I think. Yeah. You have done some really cool things by helping to transition some vineyards do you do that are you you know what what's who are you working with now like are you trying to is that an active pursuit of yours to like you know work with somebody so that you can move them away from uh kind of you know farming that's less beneficial to the world and to one that's more beneficial um i don't do that anymore in my yeah. current cycle of life i definitely envision doing that again at a larger scale it's kind yeah. of what I have in mind for the location of whatever this hypothetical farm would be. Um, in a, in a, I don't think I'll ever own land probably in California, but you know, long. Would term you lease, want to? Would you know. want to buy land here if you could? I'm not sure. I feel like long term leasing of a large property is probably probably makes more sense for someone like me. Um, yeah, water water scares me a little bit here in California. But, yeah. or the lack thereof scares me a little bit but it would have to be in a specific place but um yeah 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 sorry i, I interrupted um you, you don't think that you will own land but but when i think of like what 
is a likely scenario to come up. What seems most likely to me is like there's some vineyard that has been conventionally farmed for decades where like the people don't want to deal with it anymore and I can be someone, well, me and my wonderful team of whoever joins to help transition that land to like a regenerative model and and I don't know and see and see what comes from that. (laughs) Would it involve grapes or are you thinking broader than grapes? Oh yeah. Yeah. It would involve, it would definitely involve grapes. I don't, I don't know. I don't spend much time thinking about this kind of thing. It's been on my mind kind of recently because I I was working on something that I had to write where I was brainstorming ideas for my future basically. And I was like, well, I've spent so much time just focusing on the present, trying to get through every month, every quarter, every year without going out of business. I've never really spent much time being like, where do you even want this to go? And it's only recently that I even feel like we might be able to be in business for more than 10 years. (laughs) And like, that's a long time in new wineries, you know, a lot of wineries that don't last for more than that. Um, Yeah. So if we are still around and maybe, you know, by that time we've, you know, uh, gained a better reputation and have more of a reach, like, if things were possible, like what would what would I want to do? So that's a very new thought. Um, hmm. Post post cubby opening, post getting through twenty twenty three, second half of twenty twenty three, which was an absolute disaster. Right. Um, and twenty twenty four feels so different, so much more optimistic. Not because of pipe dreams, but because financially things couldn't be more different than they were six months ago yeah eight months ago and that i don't really get i don't really get how 2023 could have been so bad to have now be so good but it it almost doesn't matter because all the consequences from the second half of 2023 being a disaster are going to take years to financially recover from but at least you know if, if 2024 first half was the same as the second half of 2023, we would be out of business by now. But <laughs> things are so different in a good way. That's great. Does, has the cubby helped with that? Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I imagine. The, yeah. the cubby is, is both the downfall and the future of the business <laughs> right, yeah. at the same right, time. Right. Yeah. Opening a whiny, opening a tasting room, oh God, in, in California, in any like nice area with a you know, where there's zoning and everything else. It's insane, right? Like, how long did it take you that you were paying rent before you could even have a sale? Um, 17 months. Jesus, yeah. But I I just had a meeting with my financial advisor. And I do want to say on this podcast, because I know people listen to your podcast who have small wineries, there is grant-funded small business counseling in every county in California. Fantastic. So you go to your local small business development center and you find yourself a counselor because they could save <laughs> your ass potentially. And mine has saved me so many times over the wow. last five years minimum that we've been working together. Oh, thank you for saying that. That's great. Yeah. And I and the reason I mentioned the cubby was, I mean, the thing that I always want people to hear is have have a way to sell your wine before you ever make a drop of wine. Like if you, if you're planning to get into the business, like, you know, make sure you are thinking about the whole process and already have a sales avenue and plan and not just a plan, but like, I I mean, I just, yeah, I don't know. Like I can save so much stress. Like the idea of like, I'm going to make wine and then I'll sell it. It's like, where are you going to sell it? Do you know how hard it is to sell wine that you're making at this kind of size, especially if you care about the farming because you're going to be paying a little bit more for the grapes. And that means your bottle price is going to be a bit higher. And that means fewer people are going to want it just by virtue of that. Like there's almost no way as a small winery in my mind to make a bottle of wine that's in that mass sales thing of like under $15 in California. I mean, unless you are doing 
terrible agriculture and doing it at a scale that's like 10,000 cases plus. Do you, do you, I don't know, do you agree, disagree with that? I mean, I do want to push back on what you said a little because... Okay, good, good. That Please. was... I was just thinking about this also because it was one of the things that was said to me over and over again. And I think it's something that people say. It's not that sales was easy, but it was so much easier than everyone pretended it was when I was getting started. Oh. It was just another one of those things that it seemed like people that had gone through it wanted to be like, this is so hard. Like, I've done it, though. And like, oh. there okay. are. And I, it was not like... <laughs> Is, was sales easy in 2023? No. No, it was so hard. But it was cyclical. And like, it depends on, I think when you're getting started, I think the advice you just gave is very applicable in our current season. Selling stuff okay. is so hard right now. But like when I gotcha. started, it was so easy. Like, oh. because well, there wasn't good. the competition that there is now, the market was hungry. Mm for hmm. natural wine from California, hmm. uh, made it okay. small scale. There was like less than, you know, 30 or 40 of us doing it when I, in 2016. And I, as someone who's like not outgoing and, and not um, a networker or a schmoozer in any way, and I know you aren't either, but in the back of my head, when people told me that, I would be like, I'm never going to make it because I'm not that person. I'm like, yeah, not no, a salesperson. No. And so, so no one's going to care. I'll never be able to sell my wine when really it was like, I didn't have to sell my wine in those years. It sold itself just because people wanted that wine. It's like being um, a cocaine dealer. You got really <laughs> lucky. <laughs> but it is a different time now. Yes. It's a totally different time. Um, and, Selling wine is a lot harder, but I never would have done it if I had had a plan for how to sell it beforehand. And that's why I don't want to discourage. I want people to know how hard it is. Yeah. Like the reality of it while also being like, but there's possibility out there and like you should try it. You don't know what's coming. You don't know what's going to happen. It's don't true. get too attached to this, <laughs> but <laughs> you can give it a try. Well, I guess, and I wasn't saying it in any gatekeepy way, but I had an extremely different experience. I had the complete polar opposite experience of you. But it also was timing. Like you said, I mean, you started a few years earlier. I My first sales were fall of 2020. Yeah. <laughs> so mid-pandemic, which if you weren't already set up, was really hard to break in. I mean, everybody else was selling gangbusters. And I was just looking at all these people who were just like, you know, if you if you were a retail shop or whatever, if you already had sales avenues set up it was just like flying you know people couldn't keep it in stock but for me who was trying to break in at that time it was like restaurants weren't open um retail shops weren't taking on new clients because they were just like too busy to like deal with meeting new people and you know whatever like being a, a self-distributed person um and then it hasn't gotten any easier you know and it's like i've also it, it's partly my fault just not knowing the business and not knowing how to position my wine and spending too much money on grapes to get really good grapes that I really wanted to make wine with. But then that made my bottles too expensive. And I mean, just little things like labeling and things like that, like affect whether your wine can be sold, you know, yeah, where and how. And if you're, I was sort of trying to be like, I don't know. It doesn't matter, but <laughs> totally different experience. Um, and so I, I say it from that sense of like to really think through these things. Um, and I, and you know, so I just want to clarify that I didn't mean it. Like I did, I actually did it. I, I totally failed at it. So that's my, been my experience. Yeah. And, and like, <laughs> had I been trying to launch right now, we wouldn't be a company. Like right, the only right, reason yeah. we're able to weather what's going on in the second half of last year is because we were a six or seven year old company by that point. Um, and also, you know, to bring it back to the cubby question you asked, like I had this thing that I had an enormous amount of money invested in that I was like, this is going to fucking open. Like if it's the death of me or not, like people are going <laughs> to sit in this room, even if we're only open for two months, because 
we worked so hard on this. Um, but what I was talking to my financial advisor about earlier this week was like the cost of running the cubby while it's very, very good for growing the wine club and it's a good way to push bottles out. The cost of running the tasting room is almost $10,000 a month. Wow. Yep, so, there you go. That's and I know that not everyone's is that expensive. Everyone has it set up differently. And like, if I were to work it all the time, it would obviously be way cheaper. But like, I and have another be... job. In fact, I have yeah. like five other jobs. So like, I can't <laughs> right. just be there all the time. Um, and like, I think there's this idea in California right now for like producers that have been around for five or so years who are like, wow, wholesale is iffy. It could go away at any second. I need a tasting room to guarantee sales. And like that was definitely my train of thought. But of course, no one is transparent and gives you actual numbers. Had someone told me when I signed that lease, before I signed that lease, summer of 2022, this is going to cost you 10K a month about to run. Never would have done it. I would have looked at the numbers and be like, that's crazy. My wine isn't expensive enough to run that, even with good sales. And I don't want my wine to be that price. It probably doesn't make sense for me to do this. So I say to the people that are listening who are like, I need a tasting room and that's what's going to solve this. Like, that's not that's not a magic bean. Okay. That's great to hear too. And it's, I mean, you should say what your square footage is so people really get a. I mean, maybe totally... that's part of the problem. <laughs> yeah. Don't open a tape. Maybe make sure it has more than six seats. Ours has <laughs> six seats. Um, it's 120 square feet. It's like a closet, but. It is a cubby. Also, it looks full a lot of the time, unlike most tasting rooms that have a normal amount of seats. And, but like wine tasting isn't a restaurant and like, I feel like wineries are never that busy for wine tasting, except maybe on Saturday for like three hours. Right. So you don't need that much space anyway. I guess it depends on how famous you are, but we are definitely not well known enough (laughs) where we need more than six seats. Right. Well, here's a question for you. I mean, I'm, I'm talking about these things and we're mentioning like, yeah, I, you know, I was saying these things and then you, you, your pushback, I think one of the more important things about it was like how, you know, some of that is accurate for current realities, but we're in the middle of a huge transition. And what do you see as a potential outcome for wine as we come out of this? Like, what is the new wine going to look like? What are the new conditions that might be, I don't know, for good or for bad that could result of this? What are the opportunities that might come out of this? Um, gosh, I don't know. I wish I could predict the future (laughs) in that way. I think, I mean, we're going to have, I I think that's obvious is we will have a lot less companies. There is an excess Mm. of small wineries right now that aren't like they're, they're more wine labels, you know, they're not necessarily wineries. And I like, it makes me sad that so I know that so many of those people who have been doing that aren't going to do it this year or next year or the year after because they'll look at the numbers and be like, this is just never going to make sense. And they're probably right. Um, Right. But also at the same time, uh, you know, some people will do it anyway, which is good because we want diversity and creativity and, you know, as uh, whoever wants to have a seat at the table to have a seat at the table, I think. But yeah. um, I, I think when you're first getting started, you have you see other people who are ahead of you and you're like, they're making it work. There's no reason I can't be that person. But like, actually, if you ask those people and they're being transparent, mo- a lot of them will tell you that they're not making it work. Yeah. And that, I think, is is what is fundamentally going to change what we see going forward is that a lot of people have kind of dropped the act. And I've gotten a little bit of criticism about what I said in the Chronicle article that like, if, if winery people don't tell you they're fucked, they're lying. You know, a couple <laughs> right. people commented, they tend to be landowning people who like sell a hundred percent direct to consumer being like, we're thriving right now. And like, that's really great. It's so good. Yeah. that 
um, that some people are thriving right now. But the most people, anyone who depends on wholesale distribution at a certain scale might be thriving now that we're heading into spring of spring summer, but like the last nine months probably weren't thriving and in our being increasingly transparent about it. Um, but, but yeah, like it's almost like it's good to have naivete because that's what, that's what keeps the industry fresh. But I, I think we're going <laughs> to lose, I think we're going to lose some of that in the next few years. Gotcha. Okay. Um, I should mention that you're a movie star um, at least once over. Have you been in multiple movies at this point? Um, yeah, I have an IMVD. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, no. <laughs> Check out. <laughs> Could <laughs> Headshots available upon request. Um, <laughs> no. no uh, just, Living just Wine, this. my friend Lori Miller directed, so I want to give her a shout out, but um, it, it's a really lovely portrait of California winemakers who are doing the kind of thing that you're doing a few of you a select few of you and i don't know if you want to talk about that yeah living wine can be watched for free on tubi t-u-b-i and you can purchase it for cheap to rent on amazon um yeah living wine was filmed during 2020 it followed i think four four to six of us um who were making natural wine in california in different regions um mostly on the premise of like it being the worst wildfire season on record from the lightning complex fires in so many mm-hmm. different regions um and it is chock full of information it's not it's not just a movie about people it's it's a movie to really learn about why we ended up with the type of conventional farming that we did in this country and mm. Shocker, it has to do with weapons. <laughs> um, yeah, really bringing everything <laughs> full circle twice over now. Weapons and slavery too, right? Um, I mean... Basically everything our... bad is why. Right. <laughs> right. Um, but yeah, just like there there are a lot of interesting facts that like I, I learned so much from the movie, oh. you know, even working right. in, in this industry. So highly yeah. recommend. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if what oh, I, I forget now everything it goes into, but yeah, really, uh, like, despite the fact that it's sort of about the struggles that you're all facing, it was a really beautiful movie. I thought. I don't know if that came across. It's like uh, there was something um, elevating about everything that you were all going through, and yeah, great way to get to know Megan a little bit better if you aren't familiar with. It. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, it, it's hope- <laughs> it's a hopeful movie. Yeah. Yeah. And you also um, buy grapes from the place where I work right now. Is that, that's right. You work, you're working with some Piscinas Ranch grapes. Yeah. I love Piscinas Ranch uh, in San Benito (laughs) County. About 30% or more, maybe even 40 now of the grapes that I work with are from San Benito. Um, Beautiful. Amazing climate, you know, hot days, cold enough, sorry, close enough to the coast to often get a marine layer at night. Yeah, we were in it this morning. We were out um, um, shoot thinning and soaked and cold. Yes. <laughs> gray, gray skies. So these yeah. great temperature swings that we love and so many interesting varietals planted that are rare in California, interesting soils, um, and a large concentration of farmers choosing to work do organic practices which is amazing and then for me you know people are always like oh piscina is like or san benito anywhere there like that's the middle of nowhere like how inconvenient but for those of us in santa cruz we're like it's 40 minutes away excellent like nothing (laughs) could be closer um so yeah all the things kind of were correct lined up correctly um in working with San Benito for me and Piscina's Ranch, you know, watching watching that vineyard basically come from rootstock to now being in its fourth season where it's going to produce has been really, really beautiful. And, you know, sheep integration year-round in the vineyard is probably the future of organic farming in California, and people just don't know it yet. So... <laughs> 
yeah <laughs> anyone that can go to some a workshop at piscina's ranch should definitely go they do a ton of education yeah wow you just did yeah a really good job there <laughs> talking about piscina's um they thank you <laughs> uh Thank you, by the way, for, for having this conversation. Love your honesty. I think it's so helpful and so refreshing and so like really uplifting despite the fact that it can be brutal. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. I Just to end on an optimistic note, I invite anyone listening to share any feedback they had with me. It's always helpful for me uh, via email. And if you're, <laughs> if you're starting out, and you have questions and you want real numbers, real answers, or maybe not numbers, but just like some guidance about anything in the industry, I think knowledge sharing is really important. So please email me. You can find that in the contact section of my website. Please come visit our Margins Wine Cubby is what we call the tasting room in Santa Cruz. Uh, we'd love to host you and share the wines with you and um, keep supporting your small wine producers domestically they're really going through it, through it right now yeah drink local and what is your um what is your website oh my website is just marginswine.com and then mm. i'm very active but a bit unhinged some might say on instagram at marginswine <laughs> uh but i can guarantee if you thought this was raw check her out on instagram <laughs> <laughs> Um, have you ever considered changing the name of your winery to Slim Margins? <laughs> we used to get mail instead of Margins Wine um, addressed to Margin Swine. And <laughs> I, I think about doing something with that one day, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have a name like that too, Centralis, uh, and <laughs> Centralis Wine. Um, are you... Yeah, so what was I going to say? Maybe so margins just for for the sake of people associating with why with why you named it that. Why did you name it margins? Oh, cuz we work with lesser known vineyards, regions and varietals on the quote unquote margins. <laughs> um, but it also sounds like it, there's a more to it in terms of what you your vision for you know, bringing in people from the margins as well to be involved and to be mentored in given opportunity. Is that a yeah. fair thing? Yes, that's true. Um, I, I used to talk about that at the beginning, but people's eyes kind of would glaze over or they would look at me ske skeptically because I'm a white woman and be like, how could you possibly think you're marginal? Mm. Um, that was mostly judgment from a certain specific type of men. Um, <laughs> uh, but yes, of course the name is more personal, but the part that, um, that the public, you know, it also, it also is just a really good way to surmise what we do and what kind of grapes we work with. And what's the little like cabin in the woods label all about? Um, when, the art was happening. I asked my friend who drew it. It's just a pen and ink drawing to draw something something that symbolized nature taking back over something man-made. Oh. Kind of like natural wine taking over conventional wine again. Mm. Because I was once naive. No, I'm just kidding. I'm still naive in lots of ways. But <laughs> when I started, when I started, I was, I was, I was really at 26. Um, Even more naive. <laughs> I was 25 when I came up with the name. So I had this idea that, um, that I could create some real lasting change, just the way a lot of people in their early 20s do. Um, <laughs> so the the label was supposed to be a reflection of that. And my friend that drew it, I think, did a, did a great job capturing that. Yeah, As that's the lovely. years have passed, it's like, well, your tiny winery is just a drop in the bucket. But, um, right. but yeah, we still, well, still try to have intention for, you know, the small percentage of people that do come into contact with us. Yeah, and what you are what your values are and what you're promoting are still represented, you know, whether or not, you know, you are 
whether you have you sh you have the same force as nature does in the world. <laughs> I mean, whatever name well, you are, nature. We all are nature, but um, <laughs> I still think it's nice. I think I like that. I'm glad glad to know that. That's something that I, I appreciate that a lot. Thank you. Mm, thank you. And did is there anything else that you wanted to say before we say goodbye? Um, just to like those of you who list who are listening who who we have known each other for a while or you've bought the wine or you've shared a story or you donated to our crowdfunding earlier this year. Just thank you so much to everyone. This is truly a personal project, you know, owned a hundred percent by me and I felt so supported um, this year. And I'm really grateful for, for everybody that mm. supported. I love that. Thank you. Thanks again for listening. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. I want to thank all of you who support this podcast through donations, Patreon subscriptions, sponsorships, or just posting a great review and telling a friend. You make this podcast possible, and I'm honored and humbled and inspired by your support. If you'd like to support this podcast, you'll find links to all the ways you can support it in the show notes. Now let me send you off with a bit of beauty and enchantment in the form of a recording I made one night on the banks of the San Benito River here deep in the heart of Piscinus Ranch. I'm incredibly grateful to Colden Pro, the person who let this song pour from his very musical soul through a guitar into the night air as we celebrated the 21st birthday of Hannah Carrick, who momentarily added her voice to the music at one point. A special thanks to Bob Dylan for writing this beautiful music, to the moon and stars who provided lighting, to the crickets and the San Benito River who provided atmospheric accompaniment, and to the wine that brought us all together. I hope you enjoy this magical moment as much as I did. Mm -hmm.